Nell Flanders, and I'm here with noted film critic Ruby Rich. We're here to talk about her magnificent, beautiful new book called The New Queer Cinema, The Director's Cut. And I'm admittedly a fan. I thought the book was incredible, and I was there for most of The New Queer Cinema. So today we're going to talk about what that was and where we are now. Thanks, Al. Great to be here. Let's talk about the Gay Film Festival circuit of 2013. You know, mm -hmm. there's, uh, on the, I'm going to quote you. You say, uh -oh. uh, yeah, you know, this is why it's dangerous to write. You're unhappy with queer film today. You say that you call it cheesecake gay male romances and chocolate box lesbian confections. Mm -hmm. You also say, though, I will give you this, you also say that 2013 you're starting to see some shifts in mm -hmm. the queer cinematic world. So what's happening in our gay film festival world or our private download world of mm -hmm. what are we seeing? Oh, I think we're in an exciting moment again. Okay. Um, some of that has to do with the breakdown of traditional distribution and exhibition structures so that things are squeaking through again the way that they were in the late 80s, early 90s. Stuff's percolating up again. And I think there are some very exciting works. Um, I just saw a new lesbian feature that'll be coming out later this year called Concussion by Stacey Passon. That's about lesbian bed death, the infamous lesbian bed death, about the happily married wife uh, who gets hit in the head by a baseball and this suddenly <laughs> awakens her libido and she turns into belle du jour and goes <laughs> off servicing women in her new um, call girl enterprise downtown. Um, uh, that was pretty amusing to see and maybe that can be on a double bill with blue is the warmest color somewhere in some other parallel universe. So we're getting edgy. We're, well, we're getting, it's not aesthetically edgy. It's a very traditional film in many ways, though very funny. Rose Trachet is executive producer, and clearly it has the signature of her wit. Um, but it's very edgy again in terms of subject matter. Um, it's getting romantic again, too. There's a, a film that's in Inside Out called Pit Stop um, uh, uh, by uh, Yen Tan, set in this small Texas town. He's from Kuala Lumpur, but went to college in Texas, and is, he lives in Dallas. And there he is making these romances about guys and heartbreak looking for love in small Texas towns. Mm -hmm. I loved that. I haven't seen that. Like men are getting romantic. Um, who knew? Um, there's also uh, a hilarious uh, low-budget lesbian film that came out a year or two ago with one of my favorite titles of all time. It's by Madeline Olnek and it's called Codependent Lesbian Space Alien Seeks Same. And <laughs> <laughs> it's you got to love it. It's got cheesy George Kuchar style sets, and it's a sci-fi film about lesbians come to Earth um, because um, their lesbian love and heartbreak is endangering their planet's atmosphere. So what you're really saying, what you're complaining about then, is the pablum, if we can call it that, chocolate box or confection, you're talking about the sickly sweet that we're sort of in this bit of a lull, but you always rescue difficult films. <laughs> this is what you love to do. This is your positive nature. Oh, God. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Some of what you talk about was, uh, I mean, certainly I know when I was running Inside Out, we started, you know, which was the uh, LGBT festival here in Toronto. There started to be these skirmishes, but I'll bet you'll say that these have always happened, but I want you to talk about that. They started to be these skirmishes around what, what's a queer film and what's not. The queer police came in and said, this is a queer film, this isn't a queer film. So you tell me, you're the expert, how do you know what's a queer film? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows what's a queer film. It's all in the eye of the beholder. Um, no, uh, there has always been this anxiety around correct representations. What representations are good for us? What representations are bad for us? You know, as my parents used to say, is it good for the Jews? <laughs> it's like the, the gays are very big into that. Um, and nowadays, probably even more, the trans population is really concerned with that. Community standards seem to congeal around filmic representations like no other. Um, and there's also a persistent anxiety um, it's almost as though queer audiences are cathected to the screen in a way that's very, very different from, say, a heterosexual audience. They don't go to the multiplex and come out saying, oh, that's terrible that that killer was a heterosexual. That doesn't happen. But you show Silence of the Lambs, and it happens big time. Right. Um, you show Basic Instinct, and there were you know, line, picket lines around the theaters. I had to cross 
a picket line to go in to see Basic Instinct, which I loved. Um, it opened the same week as Edward II in 1992. I remember it very well. So I think that this concern um, has a very, very long history. And I've been very amused this season to see a short film by a terrific new filmmaker, Travis Matthews. It's called Interior Leather Bar. And it purports to be um, a staging of the missing footage from William Friedkin's Cruising, which of course in 1980, people were trying to get shut down as a production and, and were boycotting. So, you know, it was- I got 10 copies of that. Yeah. <laughs> right. It was hot. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So these things come around culturally. And um, I actually have an essay in the book about uh, the lethal lesbian genre of the 90s that suddenly spun out all these stories of, of women teaming up to kill. And I trace, I trace it back to that early Russ Meyer film, Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, which was a film that I admitted I hated when I saw it mm. in the 1970s. I thought it was misogynist, exploitative. And then I saw it in the queer friendly early 90s and I thought, masterpiece, what was I thinking? Because the moment had changed, the audience had changed, and um, this is one of my favorite things uh, to notice, the way in which films get edited by history mm -hmm. and they become something different. So I think we have a really great segue here to this question of the new Palme d'Or can winner called Blue is the Warmest Color, the hottest lesbian film supposedly of right now. What do you think? What do I think? Well, if I'd been at Cannes, I could tell you. Um, they forgot to send me to Cannes this year, my mythical employers. Right. Um, <laughs> but I've certainly been following the coverage as much as anyone. I'm very fascinated um, by the idea of this hot lesbian film made by a Tunisian-born French male director who's now in his 50s um, and is one of the most successful directors in France right now, Kashish. Um, based on a graphic novel by a woman uh, graphic novelist, um, who I think is also a lesbian, uh, who has yeah, denounced she's for sure the a film. lesbian. She's denounced the film as heteronormative porn. Um, the film's also been denounced as exploitative by Manola Dargis in the New York Times. However, almost every other critic, and certainly all the men, have been praising it. Um, and what to think? Well, you know, I am curious to see it. I understand it has a 20-minute sex scene. That's something new for us, for the girls. Um, there's always been this anxiety in the lesbian community about any representations of women explicitly having sex because of the tradition of pornography and the male fascination with seeing lesbians have sex with the idea that you're about to jump into bed and join them. Not you, the <laughs> mythical heteronormative man. And not you. And not me, <laughs> alas. Um, but that anxiety has never gone away. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I'm showing as I go out with the book with clip shows um, is um, s uh, a set of selections from the 1992 panel that I put together and moderated at Sundance, January 1992. It was called Barbed Wire Kisses. It had the 18-year-old Sadie Benning, um, Wunderkind extraordinaire on it. It had Derek Jarman two years before he died. It had uh, Todd Haynes looking like he was out of high school. It had my old editor, Lisa Kennedy. And one of the things we talked about was this question of what's an acceptable representation and who gets to make a queer film. Well, now it's 2013. Um, Ang Lee has already made Brokeback Mountain. Um, in general, people did not object to having a heterosexual married man and uh, world-class filmmaker make a film about two men in love. Um, but the question of who represents lesbians is still touchy. Well, I'm going to do a plug for you here because I'm such a fan of this book. And what you're able to do with this book is, for those who didn't see New Queer Cinema, it would hopefully get them to see New Queer Cinema. But never mind that. It will put them in that place where all the queer cinema that you talk about from then until now, because it takes you right up into current times and you're looking at current films, which you do so well and just puts us there and makes us relive cinema all over again. So this amazing way you have of being able to talk about cinema also makes us see cinema. So I think this is just brilliant and anybody should go out and buy this book right now because it's beautiful. So thank you, Ruby. Thank you so much, Al. <laughs> Listen to her. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.